Okay, let's go. So where did we leave off? So we saw, so recall, recall, we saw this thing called, it's funny because it's called, I mean, I said this joke before, it's called the Riemann zeta function. I haven't explained to you why it's the Riemann zeta function, zeta of s, which is the sum over all the integers, one over n to the s, right? One plus one over two to the s, one to the s is one plus one over three to the s, one over four to the s and so on. And this converges absolutely if the real part of S is bigger than one. This is all old news, right? We also saw the Euler product formula. So this is the Euler product. That this is equal to a product over the primes of one minus one over P to the S inverse. So this was a, G we interpret this as a geometric series. Um, one plus one over p to the s plus one over p to the two s plus one over p to the three s and so on. So this geometric series is one over one minus lambda where lambda is one over p to the s. I'm just reminding you how we got this. And these two things are equal because it's the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Every number is uniquely expressible as a product of prime powers. So far, so good. Now, if you'll recall, Euler used this in 1737 to prove that the sum over all the primes of the reciprocals of the primes, in other words, one over two plus one over three plus one over five plus one over seven plus one over 11 and so on. I gave it away. Well, all right, too late. Yes, it diverges, okay? Unlike the sum of reciprocals to squares. Um, so in particular, which implies there exist infinitely many primes. Of course, this is a pretty silly way to prove that there are infinitely many primes since that was known already to Euclid. But it's not that silly. So just a little bit of history. A hundred years later, Dirichlet, I think literally a hundred years later, proved that if you restrict only to primes in arithmetic regressions, primes that are congruent to A mod Q, this also diverges if and only if, now what? A and Q are co-prime? Exactly. If and only if A and Q are co-prime. So if A and Q are co-prime, if, if you're looking for primes that are 2 mod 4, you're not going to find very many of them. That sum will converge because there's a the most a finite list. But if you're looking for primes that are 13 mod 77, then there'll be, not only will there be infinitely many, and hence there are infinitely many, and hence there are infinitely many primes in a progression. Okay, so now it's not such a silly way to prove that there are infinitely many because uh, arguments like Euclid's don't apply to every, they, they apply to certain progressions, but not to all progressions. Okay, so far so good. So um, I should interject a little bit of history into here. This is Gauss. He says when he was a boy, he never really wrote this down. But he certainly made extensive, extensive tables of primes, made extensive tables of primes and logs. I wonder if it's a coincidence. I mean, it's kind of amazing. He made these long, long tables of primes, you know, out to 3 million or something, all by hand, obviously. This is 1796 or whatever. Um, and he conjectured. So this is the famous Gauss conjecture, the Gauss conjecture, as it became known, is that the number of primes up to X for which he used the letter pi. So if you ever give a, uh, a talk to a general audience about this, never ever use the letter pi of X because you'll give an entire lecture 
as beautiful as your lecture will be, you'll give an entire lecture on pi of x and then someone will say, wait, pi is 3.14. So is that just 3.14 times? I'm confused. Okay, you guys are, you guys can handle the fact that the symbol pi can be used also for a function. Okay, so pi of, by pi of x, that's just a traditional notation, the number of primes up to x. And his conjecture is that this is asymptotic to x over log x. So again, what this means is if you, i.e., if you take pi of x, you multiply by log x, you divide by x, as x goes to infinity, that ratio goes to one. Okay, that's what asymptotic means. Now, as we'll see, this is the wrong, he in fact conjectured the right thing. So this is, this is actually the wrong prime number theorem. A much better prime number theorem is that this, he said something like, the probability of a number of size x of being prime is like one over log x. And so if you extend that, there's some probabilistic argument that says what you should really be comparing to is an integral of dt over log t out to x. Maybe let's start at two. I mean, there's some constant difference. Doesn't depend where you, doesn't so much depend where you start. But this is really the right thing. This is called the logarithmic integral function. Lie of x. Logarithmic integral function. And this is the much, much uh, better function. So it's asymptotic. Its first term in its asymptotic expansion is uh, x over log x. So they have the same asymptotics plus uh, the next term would be x over log squared x and so on. So let's just say big O of x over log squared x. But the point that I want to make is that this is actually a much worse. Uh, should I show you this? I think I can. Let's just take one second and see this in Mathematica. Why not? Why not? Okay. Can you, can you see this? Okay, so this is a, a fresh, so let's see. Uh, prime pi, prime pi of 100. Yeah, good, there's 25 primes up to 100. Okay, so this is the prime counting function. So if I plot prime pi of x, as x goes from two to 100, all right, so, oh, come on. Give me more points. Plot points uh, 40. Come on. There's no straight lines here, guys. There's no straight, it's, it's always skipping. Uh, 100. Right? Wait, what, is, what is this pi the like function on integers or is it? It's a function on, uh, it's a function on uh, any real number. And it tells you how many prime numbers there are up to that real number. So it's it's flat until it hits a prime and then jumps up by one. And then it's flat and then it jumps up by one. Oh, you saw like lines with I saw, I saw diagonal, okay. which is just it hasn't it hasn't computed. Right, okay. <laughs> There's no diagonal lines. It's it's flat until it hits a prime and then it jumps. So here, I mean I started it at two. Maybe I should start it at zero. Then you'll see. So it's zero, and then and when it gets to two, it goes up by one. It gets to three, it goes up by one. It gets to five, it goes up by one. Seven, it goes up by one. Eleven, it goes up by one. Thirteen, and so on. So it's going up. And I guess what's the largest prime less than a hundred? It's like ninety-seven. Is ninety-seven prime? I think so. Yeah, ninety-seven. So this is ninety-seven, and it's flat for ninety-eight, ninety-nine, a hundred. Okay. So this is the prime pi function. Now, on top of this, I want to plot. So let's see what this looks like, not to a hundred, but to a million. And in fact, 3 million. This is where Gauss computed in 1796 or something, out to 3 million. I mean, it's just a straight, it's a straight shot, but it's not clear. Let's see, let's plot range all, because I don't think it's, oh, is it starting at the origin? I think it is maybe. Plot range all. It's not doing, no, it's not doing any funny business. This is the origin. And this is what it looks like. Now, it's very hard to tell from the data what's going on. Should I make this a little bigger? Can you see? How about that? Is that a little better? It's not so easy to tell from the data what's going on. But 
Gauss's first guess is this is very similar to x over log x, log of x. So there's x over log x. And it's a little, it's not quite, not quite there, but it's asymptotically, if I take the ratio, so let's do another plot of the ratio of this thing over this thing. Well, okay, it starts out with some crap, but then it starts flatlining and it's headed towards one, okay? But pretty crudely, I mean, you see, we can, we can at this scale easily tell which one's which, or at least we, maybe we can't tell which one's which, but we can tell there's a difference. Now, let me show you one more function, which is the function, let's see, lie, logarithmic integral. Uh, logarithmic integral, lie of, uh, log int, log integral. Log integral, is this the function? Yes, okay, log integral of x. Let's see. Uh, let's, let, me, let me make sure this is right. Um, here, I'll do integrate, integrate uh, one over t dt as t goes from, let's say zero to x. Well, it does, okay, you have to be a little careful if you're gonna go from zero to x because you pass through uh, one over t. Oh, sorry, one over log t, what am I doing? It's one over log t. I didn't write one over t, did I? Of course, it's one over log t. Yes, it's log integral, okay? So log integral is this function, uh, the integral of one over log t. So let's put that in, log integral of x. Which one's which? So let me get rid of this x over log x. Let's get rid of that. There's one curve. It's, it's an exact match. Uh, so there's no point in taking the ratio. What we can take is the difference. Oops. So now let's take the difference. And what you will see is something that can be completely explained by Riemann. And notice if we're going out to um, 10 to the six, the square root of that is about a thousand. And this is staying within minus a thousand, a thousand. So that's the square root of uh, X error. So this error is like a Brownian motion. This enter error is, I mean, that's that's the human hypothesis. That's what, that's what we're getting to, okay? And in fact, what, what, sorry, question? Gosh, it looks like one of them's larger than the other for all time. Is that true? <laughs> uh, it looks like it. And it appeared and it, it goes out for a very, very, very long time. <laughs> and one of the first things uh, Littlewood did, uh, maybe this was right after his thesis or during his graduate years, I forget, is to show that this thing will cross infinitely often. And the first time it crosses is called Skew's number. Uh, I think Skew's was Littlewood's PhD student or something. Because uh, he, he, so, all right, we'll talk about if effective versus ineffective proofs. But anyway, so this is, um, this is what, this is what we're, we're after. We're after a proof of the prime number theorem, which is that there is this asymptotic. And I want to just show you that the logarithmic integral is the right prime number theorem, as opposed to the one you find elsewhere, which says, x over log x. x over log x is nice. It's, I mean, it's an asymptotic formula, but it's not, the error is way, way off compared to this error. Okay. All right. Uh, back to, back to our notes. Yes, good. I wrote the right thing here. dt over log t. So that's one over log t. If you go from zero to two, there's a constant and you have to worry about the fact that log is blowing up. But, but if you do this kind of symmetrically, then the blow up cancels on both sides and you get it. But just forget it. Uh, start at two. Don't, don't uh, hurt your brain. Um, anyway, so, so this is the correct function. And this remained a conjecture until, uh, so this conjecture is from, you know, around these times. A hundred years later, 1896, this is proved independently by Adamar, Hadamard, and Delavalle, 
Now I think I checked there. Did I check their spelling? The sen. Independently, prove Gauss's conjecture. This prove this, and and it becomes known instead of Gauss's conjecture as the prime number theorem. Prime number theorem. And I've left space here because, of course, what they're doing is they're following a strategy outlined by Bernard Riemann in a extremely influential memoir in 1859, a strategy for proving for proving the prime number theorem. So that's what I want to explain to you. So far, so good? Yeah, this makes sense? Okay. So a key ingredient, a key ingredient in this proof so let's, let's talk about this strategy. He realized that so, so some key, key observations, key observations or realizations or discoveries, discovery. So remember Zeta, our original Zeta only converges if the real part of S is bigger than one, there's a trick that you can, there's a silly trick that you can do to get it, uh, a version of it to converge with real part of S bigger than zero. But uh, it takes quite a bit more ingenuity. So Zeta has meromorphic continuation which is uh, holomorphic except for a pole at s equals one. S equals one, remember, is the uh, the harmonic series, right? If s is one, then I'm just adding one plus a half plus a third plus a quarter. So this is the divergence of the harmonic series where harmonic series diverges. Okay. So there's nothing you can do about that, but except for that, it has, it's, it's an entire except for this one singularity. It's almost entire function. So that's one observation. And the other observation is the key role played, key role, oh, I said role, key role played by the zeros of the zeta function. And this is where the Riemann hypothesis comes in. So let's prove a little lemma to show you why without this analytic continuation, you would never know that there's any funny business going on. So here's the lemma. Um, zeta of S does not equal to zero. It has no zeros on real part of S is greater than one on this region of absolute convergence of the initial series has no zeros. Proof. Can anyone give me a proof? How can you tell that a series is, is zero or not? It's, it, it's, it's nearly impossible to tell when a series vanishes. Could you use the product formula? Yes, awesome, Thomas. It's not so hard to tell when a convergent product vanishes. So this product vanishes, vanishes, since it's convergent, this is convergent, absolutely convergent, right? We proved that last time, you remember? If you have a product, an infinite product that, that's absolutely convergent because the terms are convergent because real part of S is bigger than one and one over P to the S converges in absolute value. So it vanishes if and only if, if and only if some term does. So let's look at the terms. Well, the terms, each term is one over one minus one over P to the S. I don't have to do anything. It's one over something. Unless the denominator blows up, it's not zero. This isn't zero. And let's just check where would the denominator blow up? This has a chance of having a problem. This has uh, well, this vanishes, let's say it like that. 
this vanishes if, uh, let's see, uh, well, let's just do it like this. One equals one over P to the S. So P to the S equals one. And of course, P to the S is E to the, uh, E to the S log P equals one. And that's if and only if S log P is uh, what? An integer multiple of two pi i or something? In particular, the real part of S has to be zero. I mean, if I divide this out, S is uh, n, some, some, some integer times two pi i over log P. P is at least two, so there's no problem with log P. Log P is a, two is the first prime. So implies the real part of S is zero, which is way outside the range where things converge absolutely and where we would be interested in this function. Okay, so this is like a very trivial lemma. It has no zeros. If you don't analytically, meromorphically continue it, you will never see the zeros. Let's, let's just see that for a second. This is what we're, we're working up to. Okay, so let's see if this works. Complex plot 3D of the, the zeta function, Riemann, how about zeta? Zeta of S, as S goes from, let's say one minus I times 10 up to five plus I times 10. Let's make it uh, 10 by 10 and 10 by 10 and, and I'm just making the, uh, the length the same as the, the height. Let's see, uh, so the real part, so I'm looking at the real part going from one to 20 and the imaginary part going from minus 10 to 10. Um, there's, a, there's a pole at one. So this is blowing up, let's see, plot range. All we might get in trouble. Yeah, all we can't do. All we can't do. I mean, this really is the, the view of the zeta function that, that you might imagine. It's not doing anything. It's just, it's just flat. It's boring. It has this pole at s equals 1, which we can see very clearly. And, uh, and otherwise, it's, it's basically 1, right? If, let's look at the series. The series is 1 uh, times one plus one over s, one over two to the s plus one over three to the s. And if the real part of s is large, then none of those other terms matter. It's just one. And yeah, it's spinning, but but this you know because s can have some imaginary parts, so so you're spinning um, the the terms. Anyway, th this is pretty boring. It's only when you get to inside. Let's go now to minus ten to ten in both variables. Now you're going to see some crazy stuff. So, um, and we have to go a little farther out here. So you still don't see very much. Let's see, one is right here. So one, hopefully you see that one is a pole. It's showing us a little bit of the pole. Out here, the zeta function starts growing. It starts growing in the, um, in, in the t direction, in the imaginary part. And it picks up a bunch of zeros. It has these funny zeros at the negative even integers. We're going to get to this. So that's what we're seeing here. This is negative. Uh, this is negative two, negative four, negative six, negative eight, and so on. It has zeros. It has no zeros over here, and it has this uh, this pole there. Okay. So we're going to prove all of this. We have to. This is what I'm I'm foreshadowing. What we're working up to. Um, now. Here's, here's where some magic happens. Let's go up to 20. And well, it's, it has this symmetry. Uh, all right, let's, let's keep it. Forget the symmetry for a second. If we go out to 20, then you see that right there? That right there, that's our first non-real zero of the Riemann zeta function. That's at a half plus about 14, 14 and change. If I go a little farther, 25, and there's a symmetry across the uh, the real line. So there's also one at a half minus 14i. 
and there's another one at 21, and we're developing another one near 25. So if we look in, uh, let's see, will it let me go out to 50? Oops. Out to 50. So we have these very well understood zeros on the negative even reals. And then we have this list of these crazy zeros of the zeta function on the real line, real part of s is a half. Okay, this is of course worth a million dollars if you can explain why this is happening. All right, so, so these zeros only show up if you can analytically continue the zeta function. So let's go back. Any questions on this before I take away the, the eye candy? Okay, so let's go back. So um, what Riemann shows, so first he gets a meromorphic continuation. How is he, how are you drawing the zeta function once you're not in the region of absolute convergence? Once you're back inside um, minus, once, you, once you're to the left of real part of s equals one, how do you get a meromorphic continuation? And how do you learn something about the zeros? And he showed that you, there's, there's a weak version of this, of knowledge about the zeros that will imply the prime number theorem. And that weak version is exactly what Hadamard and Delva Poisson proved. And then there's a much stronger version, which is the Riemann hypothesis, which, which we will talk about. Professor? Oh, yes. Um, I'm not convinced by our lemma proof. Please. Um, because what if you have an infinite product where every single term is one half? Th that infinite product doesn't converge. If you have a convergent, remember we proved this theorem? We proved that uh, if you have a product of n, f, n of s, and f, n of s minus one is bounded by some constant, and the sum of those constants converge, then this product converges hmm. and is equal to zero if and only if uh, some one of these is equal to zero. Okay. You remember that? That was from before Thanksgiving. So maybe we had a lot of turkey between now and then. But um, it, you're absolutely right. If you had a whole bunch of a halves, well, a half minus one is not bounded by something that, that's convergent. So the terms themselves have to be very close to one. And these terms, the individual terms, uh, are sufficiently close to one because if you look at what this series is, this series, each of the series starts with one. So when you subtract off the one, you have, you have this sum. Yeah. And this sum is convergent because real part of S is bigger than one. So it's convergent for the same reason that one over N to the one plus anything is convergent. Okay, I see. So, but uh, in the infinite product of halves, isn't like the nth partial product one over two power n, and shouldn't that yes. go to zero? Yes, exactly. That's what Nick is saying, I guess. But the point is the difference between a half and one is a half. And if you add up a half infinitely often, you don't, that doesn't converge. So built into our notion of convergence of a product is this condition on the terms, even if the product does quotes converge. Because like yes, obviously- a, conver the a convergent product by a convert. Okay, so um, you're absolutely right. Um, the convergence of the partial products to something other than zero, to anything other than zero is captured by the individual terms. The difference between the individual terms minus one having a convergent series. So let's recall. Let's recall. Recall. Let me state this. Let me state this precisely. Suppose uh, we have a sequence of functions f n. These are all functions from some region to the complexes, and there exists a sequence c n with series converging such that. Um, such that uh, for all s in omega, f n of s. This is where we were talking about uniformity. So these, these terms are, are getting closer and closer to one for every single uniformly in, in s. 
then the product over n fn s converges absolutely converges to a holomorphic function holomorphic function and is equal to zero if and only if some term is so the what you're saying is but there could be also sequences that converge without individual terms being zero yes but those won't be sequences which differ from one by a convergent by a convergent uh, we're just we don't satisfy the hypotheses of this of this lemma does that make sense okay so you don't see any zeros of the zeta function until you go to the right of real part of s equals one all right now to really get to all of this to really get to to uh, get this uh, uh, analytic continuation, analytic or meromorphic continuation, continuation, we need to study. Need it's convenient to study something called a Mellon transform. Mellon transform, which is a cousin of the Fourier transform, particularly adapted to Dirichlet series. Do you guys know what a Dirichlet series is? When I say a Dirichlet series, you know what I mean by that? So power series, we know power series. Power series is just, you know, uh, summation a n z to the n. That's a power series, or z minus z zero to the n. A Dirichlet series, so-called Dirichlet series, I mean a sum over the positive integers, a n, and not z to the n, but one over n to the s. Okay, so that's why uh, if the a n's are all identically equal to one, we get the zeta function. So that's why the Riemann zeta function is a Dirichlet series studied by Euler, defined by Euler. That's the, uh, and they're going in reverse chronological order. Okay, so this, what's convenient about, I mean, this again is E to the S times log N. So it's some kind of change of variables from the uh, standard Fourier transform. It's a logarithmic change of variables from the standard Fourier transform. The, for, the, the standard Fourier transform, standard Fourier transform would take a function F, a test function F, and would make the Fourier transform out of it how can you remind me? Has it been too long since we had our Fourier, Fourier analysis chapter? Yeah, it's an integral. You take f of x, you multiply, okay, thanks, Thomas. You multiply by e to the minus 2 pi i x times c dx, right? And you do this over the entire real line. And if you recall, this dx, did we talk about Haar measure? I think, I think we mentioned Haar measure. In other words, it's the invariant measure. There's really a group here. It's the real numbers with the addition as the group law. And this is a character. This is a character, meaning if you, uh, if you apply the group, if the group is you replace x by x1 plus x2, then this is still, uh, this becomes a product of those two things. So it's a homomorphism to the uh, complex numbers from your group. Okay, so let me define a Mellon transform. So definition, a Mellon transform, given a test function f, typically it's denoted f tilde. And now I'll, I'll go back to using s instead of z as the traditional uh, in this part of the subject variable, complex variable. So again, S I will always write as sigma plus IT, where these are real. Okay, so this is the sigma is the real part, T is the imaginary part. Okay, what is the Mellon transform? It's the um, logarithmic version of this. So I take F, let's call this at T or something. I multiply by uh, I, the group, instead of the real numbers with multiplication, it's the positive real numbers. 
Instead of the real numbers with addition, it's the positive real numbers with multiplication as the group law. So I'll integrate over the positive real numbers. There's a character. The character is t to the s. Because if I multiply two real numbers, t1 times t2 to the s is t1 to the s times t2 to the s. So this is the new character. Character because t1 t2 to the s is t1 to the s times t2 to the s. So there's a homomorphism to the complex numbers. And then the Haar measure, the invariant measure, is dt over t. This is invariant measure. This is invariant. Invariant under the group law. So if I replace x by x plus 7, dx is still dx. Here, if I replace t by t times 7, this is still the invariant measure. Because if I replace t by 7 times t, so this is invariant under x goes to x plus 7, dx goes to dx, sends dx to dx. Right? dx doesn't change when you shift by a constant. Here, dt does change. dt changes by a factor of 7. But dt over t has a factor of 7 on top and on bottom. So it sends dt over t to dt over t. OK, this is just, I'm just putting, you don't have to really understand what harm measure is. I'm just pu putting these words in your, in your brain. So this is what's called a Mellon transform. And there's an inversion formula. So before we get to the inversion formula, so let me, uh, let me give you an exercise. Exercise. This one I really, uh, this one is to be handed in. Let's call this exercise one. Um, let t, since t is positive, make a change of variables. t is e to the x. And x is now ranging over all reals. Let t in, in this formula show that f tilde is uh, the Fourier transform of some related, of some f, big F, related to little f. OK, here's the exercise. So make some change of variables and explain to me how these two things are literally the same thing, one and the same. And if, well, I've given you, maybe I gave too much away. I gave you the change of variables. You just make this change of variables and, and you sort of read it off. OK, four particular values. And how, what's the relationship between S and C? OK, so you can use this relationship to prove the Mellon inversion formula. But um, yeah, OK, we, uh, I want to give you a break. So let's not do the Mellon inversion formula, because that'll take a few minutes. But let's do an example. Example. So here's a nice function. Why don't we try? Yeah, I didn't say when this converges. I mean, this only, uh, this has to make this, we, we need some class of functions for which this converges. Let's see if this, if this function is sufficient in our class. Let's try the exponential function. That seems like a nice function to, to test out. So what do you think? Does this integral converge? Uh, does this integral uh, e to the minus t, t to the s dt over t, that's the Mellon transform of the exponential function, does this converge to a holomorphic function of s? Thomas, do you say yes? Why? I think I recognize it. <laughs> OK. As the gamma function? This is the gamma function. This is exactly what the, the gamma function is. Oftentimes, it's defined just out of nowhere. It's not out of nowhere. It's just a Mellon, it's Mellon transform that's important. It's not gamma function that's important. It's Mellon transform that's important and exponential function that's important. OK. So the Mellon transform of the exponential function is the gamma function. OK, but, but so we gave it a name. That doesn't, that doesn't prove that it converges. 
So where does it converge? So we have two places that we need to worry about, right? We need to worry near zero and we need to worry near infinity. So near zero, near zero, e to the minus t looks like one, right? e to the minus t is just going straight to uh, e to the zero, which is one. So our integral near zero looks like one and then t to the s minus one dt. Now this converges, and if we take absolute values, then it's t to the real part of s minus one. And this near zero, near zero converges absolutely if and only if. I need this exponent to be near zero. How do you get something to converge near zero? The exponent has to be Yeah, uh, okay. Uh, everybody's holding something up and I'm not sure how to interpret it, but you're holding up the same thing. Uh, I'm too dumb to remember this. All I remember is one over T to the alpha converges out here if alpha is bigger than one, right? Because one over T squared converges. And so in this range, it's the exact opposite. One over T to the alpha converges if alpha is less than one. And so I need alpha which I guess is the negative of this exponent. So I need one minus real part of S to be uh, less than one. And if I move real part of S to that side and one's the, the ones cancel, I get zero is less than real part of S. Does that make sense? So this will converge very nicely as long as the real part of S is bigger than zero. How about near infinity? Near infinity, we have e to the minus t times t to some power. Who wins? t to a power is blowing up. e to the minus t is decaying. All together now, yeah, the, the decay wins. So the integral at infinity, this is just finite in general. e to the t wins. This guy wins. Okay, so there's no problem near infinity. There is a problem near zero, which is not a problem as long as the real part of S is bigger than one. So this formula does define a nice function and you can do the analysis by taking epsilons on top and bottom and, and seeing what happens in the limit. So this is nice and holomorphic as long as, uh, for, as, long as uh, you integrate from epsilon to one over epsilon. I mean, to do this for real, to do this uh, slower, then I want to go, you would integrate from epsilon to one over epsilon, for example, of the same function, e to the minus t, t to the s dt over t. And you would show that this thing, well, this thing is entire actually, but it only converges uh, as epsilon goes to, as epsilon goes to zero, it only converges if the real part of s is bigger than zero to that function, which is, which is gamma of s. So the book does this very slowly. Let me let you read the details there because I want to move on to bigger and better things. All right, that's where the gamma function comes from. It's just the Mellon transform of the exponential function. And let's take a break. And when we come back, we'll do the Mellon inversion formula. So let's go. Um, okay, so we have this inversion, uh, sorry, we have this transform so I'll write it again, again, uh, the Mellon transform of some test function f of t on the positive reals is you multiply this test function by t to the s, which is the kind of character, which is the appropriate character, and this is the invariant measure. So um, I claim, so let's prove a theorem, this is Mellon inversion. Mellon inversion formula. I claim, so let's say, um, let's say your test function is smooth and compactly supported on zero and infinity. Okay, so this is smooth, although really I only need uh, two continuous derivatives for the proof that I'll, that I'll show you. But just for simplicity, let's say it's smooth. And for even more simplicity, let's say it's compactly supported, compactly supported. Okay, so it's like from some epsilon to one over epsilon. So I don't have to deal with any 
analysis right now. Okay, you'll allow me this, this class of functions. We will immediately break this by uh, asking for, for example, the exponential function, which is not compactly supported, but it has so much decay at infinity and enough decay at zero that we can, that the same thing will work. Okay, but just for now. So if you have such a thing, then if you take this Mellon transform, F tilde of S, this is gonna be a nice, if it's, if it's really compactly supported, then this is entire, right? Because you're integrating from epsilon to one over epsilon. This is a nice holomorphic function and its integral will be entire. What I can do is I can multiply it by the opposite character instead of t instead of e to the two pi i x c I multiply by e to the minus two pi i x c or whichever way is the opposite. The uh, new Haar measure is just uh, d s because we're on the on the phase space on the transform side. And I will multiply. I'll divide by one over two pi i, and I'll integrate over the vertical line two. So what this means is an integral from two minus i infinity to two plus i infinity. And as you'll see, there's nothing special about two. Two is just a convenient. So here's two and I'm integrating over this line. Okay, of this function. I claim this will recover. T appears here, S is getting integrated out. I claim that this will recover F of T. Okay, let me make this an exercise, exercise to be handed in, exercise two. Derive this from the Fourier inversion formula. Fourier inversion formula. By the same change of variables, you can derive this from what you know about Fourier inversion but I'll give you a better proof. So this is a proof that uh, appears in a paper of mine with uh, Dorian Goldfeld. So the naive thing that you might do, let me give you the, the there's, there's some wrong, so wrong proof. This, this is not a wrong proof or fake proof one. Fake proof one is let's just stick in. Okay, so let's look, look at, the integral one over two pi i, this integral over the vertical line two, again, this means the real part of S uh, is two and you go from minus infinity to infinity. Um, F tilde of S, T to the minus S dS. What is F tilde? F tilde by definition is the integral from zero to infinity. You take your F, I need a new dummy variable. Let's call it U, U to the S du over U. I just put in what F tilde is. You happy with that? Okay, uh, let's, we have two integrals, we're analysts. Don't even think, switch them, exactly, exactly. Don't think, switch. Don't think, switch. Okay, so if we switch them, I have an integral from zero to infinity, F of u, du over u, and inside, I have one over two pi i integral over some vertical line, u to the s, t to the minus s, ds, that is u over t, t is a real number, t is a positive real number, t is in zero one, zero infinity. So this is a positive real number to the s, right? This is u to the s, t to the minus s. No funny business with exponentiation. We're not uh, worried about complex logs. These are only real logs on the positive reals. Okay, now we have to worry. <laughs> this, this doesn't make this doesn't make any sense. What's the absolute value of what's inside? Absolute value of this. Well, it's u over t to the real part of s, and real part of s is two. So I'm just integrating a number as S goes from minus infinity to infinity. I mean, this, this has no, it's like very far from convergent. It's, it's totally divergent, totally divergent. 
makes no sense. Can it set it equal to zero? Can we be physicists now? We could try. We could try to be physicists. We'll, we're going to do better than physicists. But yes, maybe a physicist would just stop here and say, "Yeah, this is of course. This is as as far as a physicist is concerned. This is literally t times the delta spike that u is equal to t. Because if that were the case, then I'd get a factor of t. I'd get f of t, and I'd get over t, and that would be and we'd be done. That's what a physicist would do. But we're gonna we're gonna not uh, be that cavalier. We're not going to be cavalier at all. We'll, we'll actually do this rigorously. So let's try it again. Take two. Here's the key idea. The key idea is to express this Mellon transform in a better way. Now I'm going to write, I, I hate it when people break up the du over u and u to the s because it confuses what, what, what the roles of those two things is are, what the roles are. Um, but now I'm going to write it like this because I want to integrate by parts. So this is by parts. By parts. OK, so I get this is compactly supported. So the boundary, the only reason I took I made it complex and supported is so I don't have to even think about the boundary cases. OK, it's not actually necessary because u at 0, u to the s at 0 will be 0. And f of u at infinity will also be 0. So there are no boundary cases anyway. But just for simplicity, let's forget about boundary cases. So there's nothing, no boundary cases. And then I get an integral from 0 to infinity. I'm going to differentiate this and integrate this. And the integral of u to the s minus 1 is u to the s over s. Does everybody see that? OK, let's try plugging that in instead of this. So I have 1 over 2 pi i, an integral over some vertical line like 2, something t to the minus s ds. And that something is this. Negative integral from 0 to infinity, f prime of u, u to the s over s du. Sorry, I write fast. Yeah, does this make sense? Again, don't think, interchange. So we flip them. We have negative integral from 0 to infinity, f prime of u, and stuff, du now. Du is on the outside. <clears throat> what do I have on the inside? 1 over 2 pi i, integral over some vertical line like 2, and u over t to the s, u over t to the s, ds, and then a 1 over s. Now, this still doesn't converge, right? Because this is, this is like what this really is, right? This is an integral from minus infinity to infinity. If I write s, as sigma plus i t, and sigma is equal to 2. So this is like u in absolute value, in absolute value, in absolute value, this is like uh, the same thing squared. But now I do have some decay because it's the absolute value of sigma plus i t dt, right? And t, well, this just fails to be integrable. It's like you're integrating 1 over t. So this is integral of 1 over t diverges. So still no luck. So I can't, I can't interchange. So uh, interchange is not justified. Interchange is not justified. But pretend it was. But what if? But never mind. Keep going. Now we're really being physicists. OK, can we make sense of this function? I claim we can in some non-rigorous way. So my claim, well, let's compute 1 over 2 pi i 
an integral over this vertical line to u over t to the s ds over s. Okay, uh, case one is if u over t, this is just some real number, if u over t is less than one. Okay, again, the, none of what I'm about to do uh, is rigorous because it doesn't converge absolutely. But let's just pretend that it did. This is a, uh, this is a nice meromorphic function with a pole with pole at, where do we have a problem? It's a function in S. We're integrating a function in S. There's no problem doing a contra integral except at S equals zero, okay? So here's our complex plane. Here's two, we're doing this integral over two and there's a pole at S equals zero. But if u over t is less than one, what I'll do is I'll take a little box like this. The integral over this box is zero. There's no poles. So I'll pull contours. I'm not gonna do this rigorously because uh, anyway, uh, with a whole lot of effort, you can get this to work rigorously, but it's uh, a horrible ordeal that I wanna avoid entirely. Pull contour to 100 instead of two, full contour, and, and this thing, let's call this integral i, then i is the same integral, one over two pi i, integral now over the vertical line 100 instead of the vertical line two. Um, this number u over t to the s, ds over s. Now again, this doesn't converge, but just look at what's going on here. This now in absolute value is equal to um, u over t to the hundred and u over t is less than one. This inside thing is less than one. So this as a hundred goes to infinity. <laughs> as a hundred goes to infinity, you have some number less than one to a huge power that's going to zero. Okay, so I claim that if u over t is less than one, then we just get nothing. Do you kind of buy that? I mean, again, none of this is rigorous. We'll do a rigorous version of it uh, in a minute. But does that somehow make some kind of intuitive sense? Okay, you're willing to buy, you're willing to let me have it. Case two, u over t is bigger than one. Never mind about the, if they're equal, that's a measure zero thing. Now pull contour. This was pulling contours right. I pulled the contour this way. Now pull the contour left. So now instead, um, I'll make here's our, our pull, here's our initial integral at two. I'll pull, I'll make a box like this out to minus 100. So i is equal to one over two pi i and integral over real part of s equals minus 100 um, u over t to the s, ds over s. But when I do that contour pull, never mind about the boundaries, the, the top and bottom, let's pretend that they cancel, which you can believe because um, there's a one over s. Right, so one over S, if T is getting large, then one over S is supposed to help us kill the, the tops and bottoms. So this integral is this part, but is the, when I pull contours, I pull past the pole. So I have to pick up the residue. So what is the residue? So there's plus this residue, plus the residue at S equals zero. What is the residue of this function at s equals zero? I multiply by s. You remember how to, how to take residues of things? You multiply, we're at s equals zero. So I just multiply by s and I take the limit as s goes to zero. This is, I take my function u of t times one over s. I multiply it by s and I take the limit as s goes to zero. Well, these two things cancel and the limit is 
1. It's some real number to the 0, 1. So i is 1 plus this thing. Now this, just like this, I had a large positive power of something less than 1. Now I have a large negative power of something greater than 1. So keep pulling. This goes to 0. I'm just doing a, this is a very, very quick thing, and you get 1. So this is 1 if u is greater than t. So this integral behaves like an indicator function. None of that was rigorous. OK, this was all kind of wishy-washy. But let's say it's true. Let's say it's true. Let's just pretend that we can do this. Then what would we get? We get, I'm just copying down what I had up there, f prime of u times the brackets. We just evaluated the brackets. It's the indicator function. It's the indicator function, bold 1, or delta, whatever you want to use here, of u being greater than t, and then du. Do you see that? Anna, did I lose you? No, this makes sense. Well, this isn't hard to evaluate. If it's the indicator, it's 0 until we get to t. And after t, it's 1. So I'm just integrating from 0 from t to infinity, f prime of u, du. Does everybody see that? How do you evaluate this? Fundamental theorem. Yeah, exactly. So fundamental theorem. So this is f at infinity minus um, minus f. So this my, there's a minus sign out front, minus f of t. And of course, f at infinity is 0. So this is f of t. So that would all be peachy keen if only we could make this stuff rigorous. So let's do one more, one more take. So this is the real proof now. This is the real proof. Those were warm-up proofs to show you why we need the real proof. And the real proof is, you see, when we did this integration by parts, we got a factor of 1 over s. But 1 over s doesn't converge. I need like 1 over s squared. How could I get another power of s into that denominator? Serum? Do it again. Do it again. Integrate by parts again. OK? So let's do it by parts again. So we didn't do enough integration by parts. So the real proof, now we can do it for real. The real proof is, um, OK, so again, this was f of u, u to the s, du over u. If we integrate by parts once, we get f prime of u. And the integral of this is u to the s over s. Do it again. The two minus signs cancel. I have a second derivative of u. And the integral of this is u to the s plus 1 over s plus 1. And now I have two copies of s. Then if I take 1 over 2 pi i, an integral over some vertical line like 2, now you see why it doesn't matter that it's two. We're, we're just going to be pulling contours, and the only thing that matters is we're that we're far that we're like away from zero or one or places where there are problems. So I uh, remember the formula that I'm trying to prove is that you take the you take this, multiply it by t to the minus s ds, and that's supposed to be the inverse transform. But of course I'm going to stick in this instead. So integral from zero to infinity, two derivatives of f. That's why I wanted f to be twice differentiable. u to the s plus 1 over s times s plus 1 u dt. I mean ds. There's a du here. There's a ds here. Now, are we allowed to interchange orders? Now, are we genuinely allowed to interchange orders? Thomas, something you don't like? 
No, there's just a bug on my screen. <laughs> okay. A literal bug. Yeah, a literal bug. So I'm like, like <laughs> you guys know that the original, you know why it's called a bug in code. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, right. There's a bug. There's a bug in a calculation, literally. Um, okay. So, so far, so good. Are we justified? Are we now rigorously justified uh, in, in interchanging? Of course, I'm going to interchange some of these two integrals, but now can I really do it? Um, so what will I get when I, when I do this interchange? Let's see, what else has u's in it? There's a u to the one that I want to pull out. There's a u du that I want to pull out. And what's left is a u to the s, t to the minus s. So again, that's u over t to the s. And a factor of 1 over s times s plus 1 ds. Are we justified in, in making this interchange? Theorem, you say yes. Why? I guess the integral inside converges absolutely this time, so you can swap them. Why does it converge absolutely? You're absolutely right. Mm. Where do, where is f double prime supported? It's compactly supported. Compactly supported. If the function is compactly supported, it's different. Its derivative is compactly supported. Okay, so this has compact support. So in U, there's just a, a compact range. In S, there's an infinite range. So why, why does this converge in S? This part in absolute value is just some constant as far as S is concerned. Right, u is the u integral is compact, so u doesn't doesn't make, change anything. T is a fixed constant. This is a constant as far as s is concerned. But then we have this factor one over t squared. This is like this in absolute value is like one over s squared, or maybe one plus one over s squared, just so that there's no funny business at the origin. Okay, and that integral does converge. So this is rigorous because the integrals converge absolutely converge absolutely. So we really can interchange the integrals. Let me give you another exercise. Exercise three, rigorously prove that one over two pi i, the integral over this vertical line two, follow exactly the same process that we did, ds over s times s plus one, is equal to one of two things. So I want you to pull contours, look at the top and bottom, justify why the top and bottom go away as you pull contours. If u over t, if u over t is less than one, then again, you pull to the right and you get nothing. Same as before, but now you can do it rigorously because everything is absolutely convergent. If u over t is greater than one, now you pull to the left. Where do you pick up poles? Yeah, Thomas? Zero and negative one. Yes, exactly. So this has poles at s equals zero and s equals negative one. At zero, what's the residue at zero? I'm just, uh, this is, I'm, I'm not, I'm trying, I'm trying to tell you why the answer is what it is without actually doing your exercise for you, but I'm failing at not doing the exercise for you. Uh, since I don't, I don't have any of these things memorized, I just derive them from scratch every time. When s is equal to zero, I get this thing to the zero, which is one, and zero plus one, so I get a one. What about when s is negative one? Now this term is gone, I get a negative sign, and this thing to the minus one, so this should be minus t over u. Okay, that's the exercise. I did that too fast because I want you to do it on your own. So if you believe this exercise, let's stick that in for here. So I have an integral, zero to infinity, f double prime of u. 
this thing, this bracketed thing is exactly one minus T over U times the indicator function that U is bigger than T. Then U DU. Does everybody see that? Okay. So I have an integral, zero to infinity. Ah, the integral doesn't go from zero, it goes from t. That's what this indicator function lets me do, same as before. F double prime of u, one minus t over u times u. I can put this and this together so that I get u minus t du. And now we're done. Why? Well, that's just what you get if you integrate by parts. <laughs> yeah, integrate by parts, exactly. Now, now we can integrate by parts, negative integral from t to infinity. I'm gonna integrate this, differentiate this, f prime of u, the derivative of this is one, du, and now we, we apply exactly the same thing as before. All right. So that is the Mellon transform and Mellon inversion formula. Thomas. Uh, two things. Um, one, that um, I guess it's worth noting that integrating by parts commutes with being a physicist. So if we had <laughs> been a physicist in the first place and gotten the delta function and then integrated by parts, we would have gotten the indicator function. That's right. That's and right. If we integrated fact, by parts again, we would have gotten this. That's right. So this is the difference between distributions and measures. Distributions and, are things that you, that's what a delta is. It's a distribution. It's a functional. Right. Delta function. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the actual question is, why don't we have to worry about branch cuts here with the exponent? Of Beautiful S? question. Because the, it's a great question. So remark, remark. No branch cuts, no branch cuts anywhere because all of these u over t or whatever to the s's, by this I mean e to the s times log of u over t and u over t, u and t are both positive real numbers. So this is the standard real log. This is the standard real log, no funny business. Okay, great question. Maybe I said that in passing, but didn't emphasize. All right, what can I do in two minutes? I think I can tell you a little bit about the gamma function. Let's go, so back to gamma, back to gamma, which is the Mellon transform of the exponential function. We can apply integration by parts. Let's integrate this by parts. So integrate this by parts. If we integrate this by parts, what do we get? Let's see, I, I uh, okay. I'm gonna integrate t to the s minus one and differentiate this. So the derivative of that is e to the minus that. And I'm gonna integrate this. So I get a t to the s over s. And I evaluate that from zero to infinity minus the integral from zero to infinity of, uh, again, sorry, what am I doing? Well, it's the same thing, but I, I don't integrate this. I leave this alone, but I do integrate the other one, right? It's a uh, u dv is uv and then v du. So now I differentiate e to the minus t. So this is a minus e to the minus t. And I integrate this, which is a t to the s over s dt. Yeah, you like that? You happy with that? This is just high school calculus. What happens to this at infinity? Who wins, e to the minus t or t to a power? So at infinity, this is gone. What about at zero? At zero, this is one, but this is zero. So this is gone, no boundary conditions. And what do I get here? The minus signs 
uh, can be canceled and I get one over S, which is a, a constant now, times the integral from zero to infinity, e to the minus t, t to the s dt, which I want to write as dt over t. So I should write it as t to the s plus one. So what have we learned? The gamma function is equal to one over s times What is this? Gamma of s plus one. Yeah. It's, it times itself, just shift it over. Okay, so this is a very powerful formula. So let's say lemma, lemma, uh, gamma. So this is if real part of s is bigger than zero, then gamma of s plus one is equal to s times gamma of s. Now, what about gamma of, uh, let's say one? Gamma of one, so if s is equal to one, that's an integral of zero to infinity, e to the minus t, t to the one, dt over t to the one. You guys know how to integrate e to the minus t. That's just one. And so what about gamma of two? Gamma of two by this formula is one times gamma of one. Gamma of one is one. Huh, I guess it's just one all, at all the at all the integers. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Mike, that was too that was silly. How about at three? Well, it's two times gamma of two. But gamma of two is one. So this is two times one. How about gamma of four? It's three times gamma of three. But gamma of three was two times one. Okay, so you get the point. So corollary gamma of an, one more than an integer is that integer factorial. Okay, so the gamma function is uh, an extension of the factorial function to the complex numbers. And now using exactly that same formula, so let me write it again, gamma of s is equal to one over s gamma of s plus one. This gives us analytic continuation, this formula, allows for analytic continuation or meromorphic continuation, really, meromorphic, we're going to have some poles to all of C. So here's what you do. So real part of S is bigger than zero. No problem. The original definition works in this range, right? But look at this. <coughs> if real part if real part of S is at least negative one, well, I don't know how to make sense of this, but this is fine. And this has real part of S bigger than zero. So we define on real part of S bigger than negative one, define the gamma function to be one over S times this integral, which does converge, which is gamma of S plus one. So it has a pole, it has a pole at s equals zero. This has a pole at s equals zero, but otherwise we have continued to this region negative one. So now we have a new gamma function, a new function. It's not the original gamma, it's, it's continued. So let's stop there, that's enough, right? We got to negative one, we should be happy with that. Of course, we're gonna keep doing this. So on real part of S is greater than negative two, you define gamma of S to be one over S times gamma of S plus one. Where this has real part greater than negative one. And I know what to do with that. This has a pole, this has a pole at S plus one equals zero. There's no new pole in this range. Well, there's, a, there's still this pole at s equals zero, uh, but this has a pole now at s plus one equals zero. That means there's a pole at one. But we've analytically continued it to minus two. Okay, and then you just keep doing this. 
to minus three to minus four and so on, every time shifting more and more poles over as you go, and you get the meromorphic continuation of the gamma function. Um, let me make one remark, and then we'll go. Remark, the gamma function is not important. So we're going to do, when we uh, next time do uh, the analytic continuation of the Riemann zeta function, we're going to use the ideas of Tate's thesis and use arbitrary test functions, of which gamma is, is one. On the other hand, and it's essential. On the other hand, to really understand something, we need a very good test function. And gamma is that very good test function. So it's a historical accident that gamma plays the fundamental role that it does. but. Uh, well, you'll see. I'll try to make both of these statements that are in direct opposition to one another make sense. So next time we do the analytic continuation of zeta, we see how what that has to do with uh, this error from the supposed prime number theorem to the true prime number theorem. If the Riemann hypothesis is true, we get this beautiful best possible prime number theorem. And, um, and then we actually prove the prime number theorem probably the, the class after. Any questions? <laughs>